Thanks so much. So I've been asked to look back in time to review the history of DCO's 10-year program. In May of 2008, Sloan sponsored the three-day deep carbon cycle workshop at Carnegie's Broad Branch Road campus. And I wonder how many people here today were at that original conference. I see a few hands, a few, but about 110 people from a dozen countries came. Now, I could tell you about that meeting and describe it, but instead I thought it might be fun to go back in time and I've got a short six-minute video with seven of the featured speakers and some of the comments they had to say. So please join me in watching um, this video of 11 and a half years ago. Um, I gave a presentation uh, on peak carbon cycle about a year ago to a group of physicists who allowed me one slide. <laughs> this was it. And uh, it tries to, if you follow the white arrows around, it's like two hands here on the floor. If you do start with the um, early Earth on this side, what this tries to do is put into here a time context as well. You know, 4.6 billion years ago, we've got the formation of the Earth. We have to go back to thinking what the material was delivered as to the planet. Here is that. <laughs> well, I'm going to speak to you for about 300 nano centuries uh, on, on the general topic of, of flux matters. Uh, for orientation, we are here, and, and my point is going to be that events there and conditions there have been driven by exchanges between that little layer on the crust and the underlying mantle. Those processes have allowed us to go from here, that's uh, some hydrogen oxidizing microorganisms, to there, an invertebrate, to here, there's a, there's a vertebrate in there, something grazing on the microorganisms growing. This is all at the Lost City hydrothermal vent site. To here, <laughs> highest form of, of life indulging in CO2 rich fluids. <laughs> in terms of controlling the high pressure phase relations and melting behavior of, in the interior of the planet. And not only that, melting behavior and high pressure phase relations in turn controls the fluxes of carbon inside the planet and uh, flux out of the planet in the exosphere. But before I delve too deep uh, to talk about the deep carbon cycle, I want to remind everybody that when carbon cycle is talked about, Mostly people talk about the short-term carbon cycle where carbon is exchanged between near-surface reservoirs such as biosphere, atmosphere, and hydrosphere. Uh, hydrocarbons is specifically oil. Why is oil so uh, uh, amazing? Because, first of all, because one barrel of oil, if my calculations are right, is about equivalent to the work done by 10 men, 10 people, for eight hours a day, for six days a week, for an entire year. That's approximately the calorie content of a barrel of oil. And uh, that is the reason that oil and natural gas and coal, but basically all natural gas, have become so crucial and central who lies in the 20th and 21st century. I'm going to talk today about a related problem that of climate change and a possible solution, which is carbon sequestration. 
one, one part of the solution to carbon mitigation. So I'll just give you a number to start with, and that is that it's estimated that the global anthropogenic emissions are 25 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. So keep that number in mind as we move forward, and I show you some other numbers here. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about geological sequestration of carbon dioxide, and I'm drawing heavily using images from some very uh, popular reports. The IPCC, which is the Environmental Panel on Climate Change, two years ago published a special report on carbon dioxide capture and storage. So I want to talk to you about uh, not exactly what my title says, but the relation, possible relationship between volcanism and Milankovitch cycles uh, in the Pleistocene for what's influencing the characteristics of glacial cycles in the last couple of million years. And this is work I'm doing with Peter Hybers, who knows a lot about climate. And where I'm coming from in this is from a sort of, uh, it's a political bias. And the political bias is that if we want to understand what's happening on the Earth, and when we talk about the whole Earth system, that means we're talking about the whole Earth from core to outer atmosphere. And so one of the things that drives me nuts is when I hear people talk about the Earth system, and all they're talking about is ocean, atmosphere, and biosphere, without recognizing the important part that the whole Earth system plays in it. So I, I carry around this sort of E in my mind. So as you know, some of these speakers are with us here today as are many other science leaders whose collective efforts have made the Deep Carbon Observatory what it became. But I have to say we've also suffered great loss in the last 10 years. And I want to remember, take a few minutes to remember our dear colleagues Eric Howry and Louise Kellogg. DC simply would not be what it is today without their efforts. I feel their presence throughout this meeting. I miss them terribly. Can we have a moment of silence, please? Now I want to go off script a little bit and tell you about my vision for the future. I don't think Ivan was expecting this, but um, in 2008 it was the consensus view that DCO should not address the roles of carbon in global warming, environmental impacts, or energy resources. Rather, we were providing a baseline. What does Earth do at a global scale independent of humans? In spite of talks, as you heard, on oil supplies and carbon sequestration, atmospheric change, we agreed to avoid potentially controversial societal issues. Nevertheless, over the past 10 years, we have gained key insights that inform societal issues. We have learned that all of Earth's volcanoes emit only a tiny fraction, about 1% of human CO2 outputs. We've seen the output, the power of rocks to sequester carbon dioxide. We've observed how deep ecosystems struggle when faced with severely limited resources. These and other lessons have implications for our world today. And so I am convinced that during the next 10 years we must focus a significant part of our efforts on what is now clearly an existential threat to humanity. Humans are exploiting fisheries and forests, soils and water, and natural resources of every type at rates that are absolutely unsustainable. Over the next several generations, sea levels could easily rise 10 meters, as levels have done many times in the past million years. What disruptions to the fabric of society are going to occur if one billion humans are displaced from their present homes? As deep carbon scientists, we have critical roles to play. We can place Earth's changing near surface in a deep time context. We can emphasize the unprecedented rates of change that humans are causing and their potential consequences. And we can contribute to essential technological solutions that might be able to mitigate global change. <clears throat> Our geological contributions could have geoengineering implications. And so as we look to the future, I urge all of us to shift a part of our focus 
to address what has become the greatest challenge of our time. Thank you.